Pierce Magnificent and Storied Square was also ominously known as Hanging Square, the place where the condemned met their fate on the gallows in the 18th century. Knowing its past history, one cannot walk around it at night, on a bright sunny day without feeling, and perhaps faintly hearing, the cries, moans, and groans of those who met their deaths dangling from the end of a sturdy rope. From Historic Haunts of Savannah by Michael Harris and Linda Sickler. Hey y'all. Today, we are heading out to one of the most haunted cities you can find here in the South, and we're going to explore a three-century-old hanging that may have resulted in a legendary haunting. But as usual, I've got some stuff to tell you about first. So, I don't know if you know this or not, but my sister and I are kind of introverts. Now, don't get me wrong, I love going out and telling stories and meeting people, and I have so many fantastic and great friendships, but when I get home... I like to hole up in a dark room with some white noise and focus on my research and write and work on podcasts and recharge my batteries. Well, because of that, we haven't really always been the best at connecting with y'all. We just make a show, put it out there for everyone to listen to, and then we just head back in our caves to work on the next one. And I think it's time for that to end. So Brienne and I have set up an official Facebook group for all of our listeners to come and join chat about episodes, ask questions, share your own stories and experiences, the whole deal. Obviously, I don't quite know what to expect yet with this, as at the time of recording this, we only have two members, and they both have the same last name, but we are open for business. So go ahead and click the link in the show notes or hit us up over on Facebook, and we'll let you in our our little digital lair. So, without further ado... Let's go ahead and set up this week's episode. We're going to Savannah, Georgia, and we're going to explore an infamous hanging that happened at Wright Square almost three centuries ago, but the impact of which seems to still be lingering on. Now, Georgia was the last of the original 13 colonies to be founded, and Savannah was its first city. On February 1st, 1733, General James Oglethorpe and about 120 settlers arrived there on the river in a ship named Anne, and work on the community began soon after. But one of the things that makes Savannah so unique is that it's actually America's first planned city. The general took the time and energy to create, quote, a series of grids that allowed for wide open streets intertwined with shady public squares and parks that served as town meeting places and centers of business. Initially, Oglethorpe planned for 24 squares, and 22 are still in existence to this day, and each of them have their own unique characteristics. But the one with the most famous haunting is Wright Square, the judicial center of the community that earned the grim nickname Hanging Square, for it's there that the colony's executions were carried out. But of all those who were hanged at Wright Square, it was the very first whose spirit seems to linger on. A woman who claimed innocence until her death and is still believed to be wandering underneath those oak trees in search of a baby that she left behind. Her name was Alice Riley. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. According to local legend, Visitors to Savannah's historic Wright Square have been known to encounter a young woman dressed in 18th century style clothing. At first glance, they say it seems as if she belongs there. After all, it's not uncommon for local tour guides to dress in historic fashion. Yet upon further investigation, it becomes clear that this girl isn't leading a group of visitors, 
but rather desperately searching for something or someone. Some claim that this mysterious woman has even approached them, desperately begging for their assistance, asking if they've seen her little boy who's gone missing. Yet the boy is never found, and when folks begin to search the area or even attempt to call for assistance, the girl disappears. In fact, it's said that several times a year, the local police department receives calls about this individual, but they know what's really going on. This is the apparition of Alice Riley, the first woman executed in the colony of Georgia. Alice Riley arrived in the American colonies in January of 1734. Little is known about her early life other than that she was Irish, likely Catholic, and when she got here, she was between 15 and 17 years old. But Alice didn't come to America, like most, as she didn't pay for the cost of her voyage. Instead, she arrived as an indentured servant who would work for about five to seven years to pay back her debt and earn her freedom. What's interesting, though, is that Alice wasn't ever supposed to end up in Georgia, as the ship full of indentured servants that she traveled on was actually headed to the port of Philadelphia. But the passage was a difficult one. The ship encountered a winter storm that severely damaged it and resulted in the loss of much of the cargo's food supply. So it instead limped into Savannah's port on January 10, 1734, just 11 months after the colony's founding. Only 40 passengers survived that voyage, six women and 34 men, and upon arrival, they were all ill and suffering from starvation. Of course, now, the pressing question was what to do with these sickly men and women. It's likely that most expected them to merely be placed on another ship and sent on to their original destination, as Georgia not only discouraged the presence of indentured servants, but also had a significant bias against the Irish, who were predominantly Catholic. In fact, the colony's charter specifically denied Catholics entry. Georgia shared its southern border with Spanish Florida, and since Spain had made it very clear that they were interested in expanding their colonial holdings northward, Many believe that Catholics in the colony would be more likely to side with Spain during a potential conflict, and subsequently, England. So Irish Catholics were seen as potential enemies and spies. Fortunately, James Oglethorpe, the founder and governor, not only had sympathy for these men and women for what they had endured, but was also in need of a labor force. So he purchased their indentures at a cost of five pounds per person. This price meant that it would take each of them seven years of labor to repay their debt. Many of the men were then sent to work at the homes of various widows who needed assistance, and a group of four were sent to work on the colony's cattle farm on Hutchinson Island on the north side of the Savannah River. As for Alice, she was sent to the home of a widower named Richard Cannon. Cannon had arrived in Georgia with the colony's first ship of settlers, but during that voyage, his wife and two of his children died, leaving him with the care of his one surviving son, Marmaduke. Exactly what Alice's duties in Cannon's house were is unknown, although childcare was undoubtedly one of them. But for some reason, she didn't stay there for long, and by early February of 1734, she was relocated to the Hutchinson Island cattle farm. It was there where Alice Riley was said to have met and later killed William Wise. By all accounts, William Wise was a man of unimpressive 
of not offensive character. In fact, John Percival, the president of the Georgia trustees, later referred to him as a, quote, unfortunate gentleman. Some believe that Wise may have once been a man of means, or at least a man from a respectable family. But at this point, he had little to nothing. Why he wanted to come to Savannah is unknown, but he seemed desperate to get there, initially applying to the Georgia trustees in June of 1733 to be placed on the charity list to sail to the colony. His request was declined, as he had no debts that would qualify him for charity. So if William Wise wanted to sail, he had to pay his own way. Undeterred, he attempted to apply again, this time providing letters of recommendation. But he couldn't wait for the verdict, so he took matters into his own hands and boarded the ship Savannah on September 11, 1733. So by the time the board of trustees denied his second request, it was too late. He was already on his way. On the journey, many of his fellow colonists began to complain about Wise's poor behavior and questionable morals. This likely peaked when they discovered that the young woman he was traveling with was not actually his daughter, as he had claimed, but instead a prostitute. So when the ship finally arrived, Wise didn't receive the same warm welcome as his fellow passengers, and it very much would have been within James Oglethorpe's rights to put the man on the next ship back to England. But for some reason, he allowed Wise to stay. Then, in an attempt to keep him from the rest of the community, Oglethorpe sent Wise out to Hutchinson Island to run the cattle farm. Unfortunately, this was not an ideal position for the man as Wise was said to have become very ill on the voyage to Savannah, and this work assignment only caused further deterioration to his already compromised health. And it's for this reason that Alice Riley may have been reassigned to the cattle farm to care for this sickly man. But then, on March 1st, 1734, William Wise was discovered dead in his home. His body was found in bed, with a handkerchief wrapped around his neck, and his head submerged in a large pail of water. By all appearances, this was a murder. Wise had clearly been either strangled or drowned, possibly even both. And suspiciously, two of his indentured servants were missing, Alice Riley and Richard White. Some say that Alice and Richard were boyfriend and girlfriend, while others say that they were merely lovers or even common-law spouses. This, of course, is quite speculative, but both were Irish indentured servants who traveled on the same fateful voyage to the colony, and ultimately, they both ended up working on that cattle farm. Although Alice likely worked as a housemaid, her days were far from easy, and it's said that in addition to this work, she was forced to endure a constant barrage of lewd comments and unwanted physical advances made by William Wise. But the absolute worst of it all was that due to Wise's failing health, one of Alice's duties was a system in staying clean. Quite simply, she had to bathe him. According to legend, Alice could only take this for so long, and after weeks of mistreatment, she finally had had enough so she and Richard did the unthinkable. Of this, authors Michael Harris and Linda Sickler wrote, Instead of performing their usual demeaning tasks of cleaning and grooming the sick man, they had something else up their sleeves. Richard White concocted a dastardly and dangerous scheme to free the two of them from Wise's abusive clutches and liberate them from their despairing situation. Wise was oblivious to their plan. As the two approached the prostrate, sickly man, Richard shot a quick glance toward Alice, nodded, and then quickly and coldly carried out the execution. He snatched Wise's handkerchief and wrapped it tightly around his neck. Richard then began strangling Wise with all his might, 
focusing every ounce of fury onto Wise with a single intent to murder him. Following Richard's actions, Wise laid there limp on the bed, but Alice still feared that he might not be dead and was scared that if he wasn't, he'd come after them. So she put his head in the bucket of hot water that she'd made for his bath. The couple then stole some of his valuables and fled the farm. Of course, a variation of this tale does exist, which isn't necessarily unexpected, as it has been around for almost three centuries. This version claims that the events of that day weren't quite so premeditated, and that Richard White was out working in the field when he heard Alice screaming in the house. He ran inside to help his love, but when he got there, he was so infuriated by her mistreatment that he gave in to violence. Either way, the results were the same. William Wise was dead. It's unknown how long the couple was able to evade capture, although it is traditionally assumed that they were caught fairly quickly. However, the fact that the trial against them was not convened until May, about two months after the crime, it's possible that they were on the run for several weeks. The trial began on May 11, 1734, and it was overseen by Magistrate Thomas Coston. Of course, the outcome was no surprise. Alice Riley and Richard White were found guilty of murdering William Wise by a jury of 12 men and sentenced to hang. Notably, in what could have just been a strange coincidence, Richard Cannon, the man whom Alice had first worked for upon her arrival, was a member of that jury. At some point, though, whether it was during the trial or after, Alice informed Thomas Coston of a quite significant development. It turns out she was pregnant. So out of, quote, respect for the innocence of the child, the executions were put off until after she gave birth. However, just because the hanging was put on hold, didn't mean that Alice got any other special treatment, as she was a convicted murderer and Irish Catholic. So for the next eight months, the mother-to-be was housed in a prison, never meant for long-term habitation. A primitive building, likely with a dirt floor, little to no light or ventilation, no heat for the winter months, and very little food to sustain her. Finally, on December 21st, 1734, Alice Riley gave birth to her son, James. And only three weeks later, on January 19th, 1735, she was executed for her crime. According to the British custom, which was followed in the colony of Georgia, Alice would have been removed from the jail and placed in a cart for the short ride from the prison to the gallows in Wright Square. There, a minister named Reverend Samuel Quincy was waiting to offer spiritual support. And it's said that upon her arrival, Alice sobbed and continued to insist that she had killed no one and was innocent of all the charges levied against her, frantically calling out to see her son one final time but she never did. There, in Wright Square, a rope was placed around her neck and the horse was hit to force it away and leave Alice to drop. But legend says the animal did not do as expected and it took several attempts to move the beast, which eventually just walked away, leaving her to hang mercilessly in front of a crowd of onlookers. Alice Riley was the first person executed in the colony of Georgia. As for Richard White, 
he wasn't hanged until after Alice. Whether that was originally the plan or not was unknown, but at some point after their conviction, White escaped from jail. But in a strange twist of fate, he was spotted and captured the day after Alice's death on January 20th, 1735. In a letter written to James Oglethorpe, early Savannah settler Edward Jenkins explained how he and two other men, brothers Henry and William Parker, spotted White and then proceeded to capture him, writing, quote, As we was working, one of my men said, Yonder goes a man very fast. I looked and saw the man and said, I believe it's White that broke out of prison. If it is him, let us go and take him. So we pursued him till we came to about 20 yards of him. At first sight of us, he was much surprised. I told him, your name's White. It's in vain to attempt to escape. And I immediately seized him. He fell on his knees and with many blows on his breast, begged his life. Jenkins continued on to state that Richard White was immediately taken to the gallows. And for their capture of him, the three men were given a reward of 50 pounds raised by the Georgia Board of Trustees, a significant amount in 1735, and upwards of $15,000 today. Of course, just like Alice Riley, Richard White claimed his innocence until the very end. While almost 300 years have passed since the execution of Alice Riley, her presence continues to be felt in Wright Square, and her story continues to be told. However, after all this time, the question remains, was Alice Riley even guilty of murder in the first place? We'll explore this question and more after the break. The truth about what happened to William Wise on March 1st, 1734 will likely never be known. But both Alice Riley and Richard White went to the gallows claiming that they had been falsely convicted of his murder. Because of that, the closest that anyone could have ever come to knowing the truth without being there would have been from the record of what happened during the murder trial. Unfortunately, these documents did not survive. Most of what we know about the murder of William Wise comes from letters to James Oglethorpe. In fact, the earliest surviving account of Wise's death is from a letter dated December 14, 1734, written by recorder Thomas Christie to Oglethorpe while he was overseas in England. Christie wrote that during Wise's entire time on Hutchinson Island, he'd been so severely ill and in a, quote, weak condition that he was confined to his bed. Making reference to the now lost court proceedings, Christie wrote of the murder, quote, At the direction and influence of White, Alice brought a pail of water to the sick man's bed and set it down by his bedside. Then, leaning over him, White took hold by the handkerchief, which he twisted till he was almost suffocated. Alice took hold of the top of his head and plunged his face into the pail of water. He being very weak, it soon killed him. According to Christie's account, it appears that during the trial, Alice turned on Richard White, claiming that he was the mastermind behind the crime. However, this is a slight contradiction from Jenkins' account of Alice's death, which said she doubled down on her innocence, claiming that she was forced to confess. Given that Richard White also insisted that he was innocent, might there actually have been something else going on? Some do believe that Alice Riley and Richard White were actually framed. After all, what need did Alice and Richard really have to murder William Wise? If he was as ill as it was said, essentially confined to his bed, was it necessary to kill a man who was more than likely to die soon anyway? 
There are, of course, the stories of his mistreatment of Alice, but no documents exist to support them. And it calls into question how ill he was and what he was physically capable of in such a state. It's also been suggested that Riley may have been raped by the sickly man, and the child she bore may have even been his. But again, most mentions of wise during this time describe a man without the ability to do much of anything. So the question remains, why escalate to murder if Alice and Richard simply wanted to rob him of his valuables and run away? Now, if one wanted to believe in their innocence, the most likely theory posits that Alice and Richard were victims of prejudice. For as we mentioned earlier, the colony was not exactly welcoming to either the Irish, who they deemed as a lower class, or Catholics, who were seen as possible Spanish spies. This would have been compounded by the fact that acting magistrate Thomas Coston was known to abuse his authority and manipulate trial juries in order to render verdicts that fit with his personal notions of justice. In addition, as the acting magistrate in the absence of Oglethorpe, he actually had no training as a lawyer and very little knowledge of English common law, which the colony operated under. So even if we don't consider the possible bias against Riley and White for being indentured servants, the scales of justice were not tipped in their favor. The story that was told to James Oglethorpe, Vallis Riley, Richard White, and the death of William Wise was not the romanticized tale sometimes told today of lovers escaping an evil man to be together. That variation seems to have first appeared in 1959 by reporter Lillian Bragg in an article for the Savannah Morning News magazine titled, The Woman Savannah Hanged. The tone of Bragg's writing was very much that of a tragic love story. It claimed Alice and Richard were from the same town in Ireland and fell in love before coming to Savannah together. After the pair were placed in Wise's household, Richard began devising a plan to kill the man for his harshness and sexual advances towards Alice. Then, the couple would escape and run to Charleston where they could live in freedom. According to Bragg, after the pair's capture, Wise was hanged immediately and Riley hanged months later after her son was born. Notably, Bragg was adamant in her story that the boy, James, was the son of Richard White. The problem is that there's in fact no documentary proof that Alice Riley and Richard White were romantically linked in any way. And the first instance of that being implied in writing is in Lillian Bragg's article. Bragg's insistence of Richard White being the father of Alice's son is also entirely speculative, much like modern retellings that claim William Wise was the father of the child. But this is likely due to nothing more than trying to give motive to the crime. Of course, if you do the math on when James was born, it doesn't quite add up. So then who was James's father? Most point to the timing and the mystery surrounding how long it took Alice and Richard to be captured and brought to prison. The two were kept in separate areas of the jail, as was traditional for different genders. So if it took some time for the pair to be arrested, it was possible the child could be Richard's. However, if they were captured quickly, then it may point to a relationship, whether consensual or not, while Alice was in prison, awaiting trial. Tragically, though, Alice's son James did not even see his first birthday. In a letter written by Thomas Christie on March 19, 1745, his last to mention Alice Riley, he ends with the simple but sad note, quote, The child, 
is since dead. It is for this reason that many believe the spirit of Alice Riley continues to wander right square in the vain hopes of finding the son she was never given the chance to raise. Yet with a story as legendary as this one, her morning spirit isn't the only paranormal phenomenon attributed to her. Local tour owner James Caskey wrote in his book Haunted Savannah, the official guidebook to Savannah Haunted History Tour, quote, Some claim that she practiced witchcraft and was hanged because she was a murderess and practiced black magic. A common claim is that she cursed the city from the gallows in Wright Square, and this reason is given as to why no Spanish moss will grow in the trees near where she was hanged. Of course, there is absolutely no reason to believe that Alice was a witch. Kasky admits that this is more than likely merely the result of her legend being confused with nearby Charleston's infamous murderess, Lavinia Fisher. However, there's an old coastal Georgia legend that says Spanish moss will not grow where innocent blood was spilled. So maybe, just maybe, Alice was truly innocent after all. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently produced podcast created by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider with the support of listeners like you. If you're interested in joining us and receiving additional content, including ad-free episodes, head on over to our Patreon page today. The link is in the show notes. Lucky Lady Shacks.